um, who's going to talk about why are Majorana states. And so let's welcome Gil. Thanks. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I miss most of the school, so I feel like I can't really, I need to catch up on everything that was. We have a question and answer where you ask us questions. And we ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what happened with my Rana this morning? I heard there was something mentioned. No, okay. uh, so let's see. So, what I want to tell you about, and uh, what that's to tell you about, is uh, a little bit about uh, my Rana's, and I interpreted this to be a my Rana in semiconductor, uh, sorry, uh, semiconductor realizations, and also how to use my Rana's for topological quantum computation. So, for the next for my two lectures, maybe the best title for it would be Practical Mayoranas. And I don't know how practical you find, you find the Windows operating system. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft feels like they find Mayoranas practical and putting a lot of money into realizing them. So let's go with this title. And today what I'll talk about is uh, Starting off with something like uh, the, what's special about Majoranas? So, why Majoranas? <coughs> I will go from there to the type chain. And now you get Majoranas there. And uh, because Majorana is such a long name, I think people started calling them Majorana zero mode, which can just be. Uh, written as three letters, so let's go with that. Uh, so we're at zero modes uh, on edges, on guitar chains edges. And then I'll go <coughs> to more semiconductor type realization and talk about how to actually get my run states, my runners in two DTIs. Yeah. And finally, in wires. Uh, tomorrow, what I will do is um, uh, tell you more about the non abelian nature of my run is how to uh, think about it as uh, how to think about it for topological quantum computation. There's a problem with my run is which is uh, maybe they cannot realize uh, universal quantum computing because of the absence of one gate. You cannot make a T gate, you cannot make a 5 over 8 gate with Majoranas in a protected way. However, we think that we found a way around that, uh, at least for systems that do not have uh, high frequency noise in them. And I wanted to lead up and teach you uh, <coughs> this kind of little bit of control theory of Majoranas. That would be the second part tomorrow. Uh, non abelian topological quantum computing is the missing gate for Majoranas. Uh, okay, so let's start. Uh, start me at any point with questions. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about is what's special about Majoranas. Why Majoranas? Let's just, what is a Majoran? It's supposed to be a state. That's, it's its own anti-state, a particle that's its own antiparticle, right? So it would have an operator that equals its own dagger the sense of a creation operator that also equals its annihilation operator. You would think that this is very hard to get, right? Actually, every fermionic state has it. So let's just think for a second about some fermionic state. Let's think that we have a potential. Maybe even the delta function potential. It has a state bound to it, right? So there will be some exponentially bound state. With some energy, some negative energy, right? So something like that would have a Hamiltonian that's like minus epsilon C dagger C. And it represents the fact that the state could be empty or full, right? Uh, and in this case, I should really write the zero here. And there could be minus epsilon, right? So two states, empty and full. Now, we can take these operators, C dagger and C, and write them down is two combinations. We can do that, right? They both obey this, right? 
Furthermore, they obey some extra stuff. Gamma plus minus squared equals 1. Because when you square this, c dagger squared is 0, c, c squared is 0. And c dagger c anti commutation would give you 1. So that's how it comes about. Um, and they, of course, anti commute with each other. So I can take the state and I can think about it as some kind of a site that actually has two myronas in it. No problem. We have many myronas living around us. So when we talk about myronas for topological quantum computing or any sort of uh, special myronas, what do we mean? Like, how are they different from this? What do we need to do to these myronas in order to do something special with them? What do you think? Hmm? I see. fine. Yeah. Question. So, what do you mean by two myrons? What? What do you mean by two myrons? Because we cannot count. Oh, well, I have two myron operators. Oh. So it seems like I have two states that are myron states. I mean, it's, just, it's a true statement that uh, we cannot count them in the sense that I cannot write the Hamiltonians with gamma plus squared, gamma minus squared. But I do want to do one thing before continuing, which is write this Hamiltonian in terms of these myronas. So yeah, by so many hand motions like this, <laughs> we want to separate those myronas. The problem is that every fermionic state can be described as two myron fermions. But the magic would be being able to separate them. And that's the only way in which you would be able to use, um, to, use the, to, to see the non statistics of myronas. Because two myronas do not have any unusual statistics. But just when you separate single myronas and break those, that you can see uh, the nanotinian statistics that made this whole field uh, revive in the last decade or so. All right, so one technical thing they wanted to do is just translate this into uh, the myrona terms. Actually, you can kind of guess what it would be like, right? It cannot be gamma plus squared. It cannot be gamma minus squared. Because those are zero. So the only thing it could be is, Gamma plus times gamma minus, right? Times i. Because of uh, the implant to be uh, emission complete. Oh, so let's, let's just go through this exercise. So minus epsilon. C dagger, I can write is this minus i this. I need to divide by 2. Uh, there are some room. Not so much. Uh, gamma plus minus i. Gamma minus over 2, I managed to fit it in. Uh, this is one thing C. And this would end up with minus half epsilon i. Uh, gamma minus gamma plus. Uh, minus minus 1. Is it clear? So this object can be either plus 1 or minus 1. And when it's plus 1, this would give us 0. When it's minus 1, this thing would give us, uh, sorry, the so right of this should be a, uh, this should be a plus. That's the, yes, that's right, plus here or minus there. Anyway, this thing can be either 0 or 2. This thing would be either minus epsilon or 0. This we can usually ignore and we get the form that you guess. So the next question to ask is how do we separate these guys? The answer to that was given by Kitaev in 2001. I guess there are many pathways to get Majoranas, but most of them involve complicated two-dimensional whole states. Uh, if you want, so I think <coughs> The closest to, re to actual measurement right now is the one-dimensional realization of a system that contains Majorana fermions, and that's based on the Kitaev chain model. So Kitaev gave an example of how you can get separated Majoranas in 2001. I like calling this part the Kitaev magic trick. <laughs> because we, what, what did Kitaev want to do? Or what do we want to do? We want to take a fermionic state, right? 
and separate it into two Majoranas that are not in the same place. So I don't know, like many years ago, before uh, issues with liabilities in magic shows, there used to be those tricks of taking, uh, taking a member of the audience, usually, usually a woman, putting her in some kind of a cabinet, and then sewing her body in half, taking the pieces apart, and then somehow her toes were wiggling in one side, and she was telling jokes on the other. And I don't think they do that anymore, because uh, obvious reasons, uh, you don't want to take saws and uh, chop your audience in half in any way. Uh, when I give PowerPoint presentations about this, I try to find a picture of this magic trick, but only, I can only find black and white pictures of that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here's the right, so suggested. Let's take a chain of states, of just fermionic states, namely like a tight binding model for lattice. Each fermionic state we can describe with two myrons, right? So, If I do that, of course the Hamiltonian for this object, let me remove this for a second, the Hamiltonian for this object would be sum over n. And now each side would have a Hamiltonian like the one I had below, right? Let me, instead of epsilon, let me use mu, because this is going to be like the chemical potential in a second. That's nothing. That's just like saying that these two sides interact with each other. These two myronas interact with each other. That is type hopping between each other. They give rise to a single fermionic state with a finite energy. But they can also do this. So each point here describes the minus and plus myronas of the site, and each site is marked with a number. So how should I write that? What should I write? N n plus one. N s plus one. Okay, so minus i, let's say j. <coughs> I think we had over two before, so let's keep to the over two. So I will have to have n and n plus one, but it's the plus of one with the minus of the next, right? So n plus. And now, excuse me for the weird notation, but gamma n plus 1 minus. You can use a and b if you would like. All right. And this, this sum runs, of course, between 1 and n, right? Minus 1, or what have you. Uh, why is that good? Suppose we take mu to 0, right? We don't, in that case, we won't have any connection between the Majoranas and each side, right? But it seems like these sides would form, sorry, the Majoranas across bonds would form states that so would then could be either empty or occupied. But there will be two states, two Majoranas, that now don't talk to any anybody, right? So they're just on the edge. And they're stuck at zero. Now we took this, some of this chain and allowed us to separate the system into a bunch of fermionic states, like localized states, plus two Majorana modes that are separated. Formally, I can write that H with gamma one minus commutator is the commutator of H with gamma n plus, which is, I see something like this for Eric, but uh, anybody else? <laughs> Zero. They don't appear in the Hamiltonian. Just literally don't appear in the Hamiltonian. So that was the trick. Of course, this trick is not yet the model, not yet the complete model. Questions? Yeah? I'm a bit confused because here what's happening is uh, a particle at site n is coupled to say n plus 1 with plus on the left side and minus on the other. But this seems a bit asymmetric. Uh, In the sense that, for example, the left minus is not coupled to the right. So the question whether we, I mean, I can write the Hamiltonian, right? Yeah. But you're concerned that it doesn't reflect any physical model, okay. right? Okay. So let's do the next thing of figuring out. If we put electrons back in, what does it mean in terms of electrons? Let's do that. 
Uh, so let's kick back to you. Let's uh, keep this term. And now remember, let me put this memory board over here, uh, that um, the gamma plus is C plus C dagger, and gamma minus is C minus C, is C dagger minus C, and so Let's stick them back in and see what we get. So help me with signs and stuff like that. I'm not willing to gamble on any sign that I'm going to write on the board. <laughs> Luckily, it's particle all symmetric, so usually things come with a plus and a minus. It doesn't really matter, but <laughs> you have to keep appearances. Uh, so if I sub, well, sorry, if I substitute uh, the gammas into this, let's see. So the on-site stuff should be easy, right? So cn dagger plus cn. Oh, actually, I don't need to do this, right? What is this first piece? C dagger C, right? Just C dagger C. No matter how many times I practice for this lecture, I always stop myself after the first bracket and tell myself I already know what that is. <laughs> right, so that's just CN dagger CN. Without the alpha. Right? Because the I gamma gamma is the parity of the site. Um, and there's a constant that I'm dropping. And then I have the J. OK, so I have an I. And then I have gamma N plus. That's CN plus CN dagger. And I have CN dagger minus CN plus 1. Is that right? OK, now everybody has to fight each other in this one. CN dagger CN stays put. I kills that I. There's a minus sign here that will kill those I squared. And then I have two pieces. Minus J over 2. Cn, Cn plus 1 dagger. Let's switch them around to get them back to my minus sign. Right? And then I also have this times that. Right? That's kind of a funny term. Cn. Cn plus 1. That's a mission just, just of this part. So what do we have here? Hopping? To be, to be expected. Pairing. But I'm just pairing. This is, I said electron, but these are not real electrons, right? The spinous fermions. This is single flavor pairing. And this pairing is actually uh, indicative that what we want is a P-wave superconductor. Now, what a question. Actually, what was your name? Mine? Yeah. Connie. Connie. So Connie was asking, well, how can I do this asymmetrically? That asymmetry resulted in having this P-wave uh, P pairing. Now, I shouldn't do this because but because they always tell you not to do like blackboard algebra, this is going to be simple. Let me separate these two terms and call this one delta. Well, because it's really pairing, and we don't know what to call pairing other than delta. But how do we get that? We get that <laughs> again following following uh, Connie's question. We get it by actually making the other connection over here. To make it a little, look a little more symmetric. Right? So that's what allows you to separate this delta and j in this key type model. So, you, yeah. Some of the thin chalks are very light, uh -huh. some of them are, are um, dark. The one that you used at the beginning happened to be the good ones. Yeah, but that one, the one that was. Yeah, 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 I know. So the you solution, the solution, reliable, solu robust solution is uh -huh. to use very chubby ones. The chubby ones. Yeah, because the video recording wouldn't show the lighter ones. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. All right. The in terms of size of the font, uh, people in the back, okay. All right. 
I always got C for handwriting, so I'm not going to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the next thing that I wanted to do is show you that this indeed gives you edge states, uh, even for new nothing zero. I wanted to deal with it in the PDG formalism. I wanted to derive the edge states. So let's do the PDG first. Oh, that's very thick. Uh, so for BDG, I want to transfer this into K states, right? No problem. First term, CN dagger, CN, and N, just translates to the same thing in K states, right? Okay. Hopping translates to almost the same thing, except this is plus one, right? So the Ks are not matched. So we do that K. Okay? What about the parent? That, that one is a bit of a pain, actually. Let's see. If we just naively put the CKs in, I assure you, you'll get the following. Sum over K, CK, C minus K, e to the minus IK. But now there's a positive K and a negative K, right? So if I just restrict myself to k bigger than 0, then it will be ck, c minus k, times twice i sine k. So you know, with p wave parity, you expect that the gap in positive momenta and negative momenta is opposite. There you go. OK, so this is something I can really write like this. Let me do the transition into a BDG. Sum over k, uh, ck, c minus k, dagger, dagger. Here I, I will write the momentum in BDG form in the boost space. Tau z uh, times minus mu minus j cosine k. So I skipped a step, but I think it's one that you did many, many times already. Just summing over positive, sorry, uh, looking at this object, summing the complex conjugate, you get a cosine, that's the cosine, minus delta sine k tau y. And then here I need to put the partner, the thing that I put in the back. Right, so if I write down in coins like this, with tau y being the y poly matrix, tau z being the z poly matrix, don't worry, you won't need to remember which i has the minus sign in tau y. <laughs> it's the one at the top, but never mind. Uh, and if you make everything kind of fight each other, you'll get this unintonium using this sub sub uh, substitution. Do you want me to go through this, or is it OK? Any questions? Don't be shy, it's confusing as hell. You can kind of see that the CK will go with the CK dagger with one side on the top. And then because they have reversed order in the bottom, they get the minus sign of the tau z. Why is it tau y and not tau x? Simple answer. You see that i here? That's why. Yeah, it's almost like it's the apple, the apple matrix and the power matrices. It has an i. Never mind. You <laughs> can't get them all right. Uh, okay. So we have this Hamiltonian for the Kitai model in K space. Right? What, how do we know if it's topological or not? That's the next thing I want to ask. I want this on the board, so I'm going to erase the single side ones. Is that okay? Also, let's forget about this and forget about that. And what we end up with is just the BDG Hamiltonian, the group of the Gen Hamiltonian for the K mode of the Kitai model, that thing on top. So, how do we know if it's topological or not? Well, there's issues with gaps, etc., right? But better still, tau z, tau y, they're like unit vectors. Think about a unit vector in the z direction and a unit vector in the y direction. And this is like a z component of a vector, and this is like the y component of a vector, right? So it's like a two-dimensional vector restricted to a plane. Let's draw that vector. 
This would be uh, the Z component. Let's call it HZ. This would be, uh, sorry, HZ and HY. Is that okay? And now I can change K and just draw the line. Let's do a parametric plot of these guys. Cosine K, sine K. Uh, what is it? What would they draw? Something circle, right? Actually, an ellipse, right? Yeah, exactly, an ellipse. Uh, and there are two possibilities, right? The ellipse might have, might contain the origin, or might not. What is the gap in the model? It's just the distance from the origin to the circle. Uh, ellipse, ellipse, <coughs> ellipse. What happens if the circle touches the origin? The gap is small, right? That's a Majoranus field here. Which phase has the Majoranus? The most circle. Top one or bottom one? Top one. The one that contains the origin. Okay. When does that happen? This will be the topological case. This is the trivial case. Trivial. And that happens while well, the z component has to contain zero, right? So mu has to be smaller than j in absolute value. That was your idea. Mu equals zero, what we had before is the best topological case. OK, good. How about the states? How do I find the states in this model? Well, it's not because it's so important from a fundamental physics perspective, but just in terms of how to find edge states of these things, technically, it's actually a little bit tricky. So I want to find the Majorana edge state. <coughs> uh, what I want to say is that as mu uh, goes, goes below j, this Majorana, Majorana state appears, but it's not going to be so super localized. It's going to be spread out over some region. There's another way around over here that's going to be spread out over some region. It's that state that I want to put the copy of. So I find the Majorana state, which is localized, on the edge. So I'll just write, it's, it's, it's in the particle hole space, so it has to have a U and a V corresponding to the electron and hole pieces. It should decay, right? You should put something like this, right? On the left. Is this okay? Yeah. What's the dif difference between J and delta? So is there a relationship to Ah, delta? so depending, so I had one parameter. This J, right? That gave me a J here and a J here. Uh, if you also have this one, then you get this, uh, then you get a different component between here and here. So roughly speaking, the strength of the different bond would be the difference between the gap and J, between the pairing and J. And that's a good exercise actually to play with. You know, start with a more general model and try to see what one gets. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who worked on transcellularizing model. This is the transverse field I Just the uh, thing that Jordan transformed of it. Right. Um, is this clear? I'll do this really quickly because it's not super important. Like I said, the technique is intriguing. So if you do this and you want energy zero, you can just take this Q and stick it into the Hamiltonian, right? And you want this to vanish. You can already see that it won't quite vanish because each piece is non-zero. So the first thing that we should appreciate is it's like changing k into iq. Right? And I want to find energy equals zero. So some of the square of this plus the square of this should be zero, right? But can the sum of squares be zero? Well, once you put this IQ here, there will be an I here. And then everything will be OK. Because the I squared will give you a minus sign. Right? So this 
will translate into minus mu minus j cosh q equals either plus or minus of this delta sinh q. So that will be the condition. This is actually a quadratic equation for e to the q, right? To the v to the q, to the v to the 2q once we finish doing uh, uh, what is it called? Common denominator. You see that, right? How many solutions should I have? Two. Okay, question. Uh, sorry, I didn't follow you. This I'm coming here is for like translation invariant system. It doesn't have an A. So what are you doing? Yeah, that's a trick. It's a pretty good trick. If you want to find like a localized Z state, uh, form a continuum Hamiltonian. You don't need to rewrite the Hamiltonian. You can just start by saying, let's look for a solution like that. Let's stick it in. Right? But then you have to have boundary conditions. And for this Hamiltonian, because it only has nearest neighbor hopping, the boundary condition that you need this psi of n equals 0 equals 0. Then there's another question. How can we do that? Can this have it? No. No, that's a problem. But, that's, but, but we are heartened by the fact that this has two solutions. Because if this has two solutions, I can write this. This would be one solution, and this would be second solution. Now that'll be okay. So actually, if you want a really nasty exercise, you can prove that you have two solutions <coughs> of this. If there, you have two, two relevant solutions for e to the q, if you're in the topological phase, but not if you're in the q phase. Yeah? Well, if you have two boundaries. What? Well, if you have two boundaries n equals 0 and to n at like 100 equals 0 too. Yeah, so that, well, okay. So we assume that the two boundaries are far away from each other, right? Otherwise, I would have to, you know, we'd have to balance it in a slightly different way. But also the other boundary will have another solution with a plus and a plus, right? So although I need four solutions, I'll get two because I have the plus minus here choice and another one from the quadratic equation. Now, there's another condition of the equation, right, that e to the minus, uh, the, the, the solutions have to be such that their, um, that their magnitude is smaller than 1, right? Otherwise, it won't decay. There cannot be a, a unity. Right. So everything seems to kind of fit, right? We'll need two solutions. We'll get them. Now, this u and v, what can they be? We, we'll have to have, uh, right, so we'll have to have a solution for the kernel of these things once we put the proper q in that will fit the two solutions, right? It should also be in my run. Let's test that for a second. So actually when you have tau z and tau y, actually any two poly matrices, there's only one way in which you can get a kernel to that matrix. They have to have the same coefficient, and one of them should have an i on it. Otherwise, it's impossible because it describes, you know, if everything is real, so we just score the Hamiltonian and we get the sum of real numbers. So, if we put this q in, or i q in, then we'll have some coefficient times tau z, right? Minus i tau y, right? Or maybe plus, depending on the choice of sign over here. Let's just go with minus for now. And you'll see how it operates for the plus. You know what the difference would be, right? The plus and the minus determine whether you want the edge state on the right or on the left. That's what it is. And I think the minus one goes with the left. Anyway, so that would be some coefficient. Tau z is 1 minus 1. Tau y, I told you you shouldn't remember which i goes where. Kind of lies. Minus 1 and 1. And you immediately see that this 
This is a dimension one matrix. Has a kernel. What's the kernel? One one, right? My one are they all symmetric? It had to be. If I had the other choice, plus, it would be a plus here and a plus here, it would be one minus one. The other Majorana. Right? But what this means is that the state that we're looking at is C dagger plus C. But note that C will describe some kind of a spread out wave function with these guys. It's not just the left most side. Okay, so everything seems to work. I'm running a little bit out of time, so I don't want to actually solve this quadratic equation. Uh, yeah, in general, I think you're supposed to be exempt of solving quadratic equations past a certain age. <laughs> what do you mean? That's the only thing you can solve past certain age. Maybe I shouldn't comment further. <laughs> yeah, so actually I have notes written up for this, so I'll just send you the notes. In the notes, I show you that I can solve this quadratic equation. <laughs> <laughs> but the option, the option is that when mu equals j, you'll find that one of the solutions becomes 1. Namely, the a to the minus 2 becomes 1. And that shows the phase transition, right? So the Majoranas get to localize, localize, localize until they meet each other and all over separated. And that's when the transition to the trivial phase occurs. Now, uh, just a word on topological protection, which I don't have in the notes, but I realize it should say. If the two Majoranas are separated, you have two states in the ground state of this Hamiltonian, right? Uh, for positive energies. They both have zero energy, but they have to do with the parity in this 2x stage, right? Gamma to the left and gamma to the right might be minus 1 or plus 1. But no local measurement in this chain would be able to distinguish the two states. That's where the topological protection comes. You want to write information into the parity states of those two separate mirrors. More on that tomorrow. All right, questions in the guitar model so far. Is it possible to have a tau x? There are three Pauli matrices all appear. Can that can that happen? Uh, not for this class. So if you do that, you'll destroy that topological class. So it takes you out of the proper, you know, the C three. I don't know which. I don't. I never remember which class this actually is. Uh, but it's particle symmetric with no time reversal. D class D. What? Class D. Class D. Thank you. How do you remember this the table? <laughs> I can really check that one. <laughs> I, mean, I can tell you what each letter means, but uh, putting them together is still a project. Uh, yeah, so you'll go out of the appropriate uh, symmetry class. And this symmetry class is the one that has Z2. Um, right. Uh, actually, it, it might be Z. But then, uh, no, Z2, Z2. Because if my own are in the same place, they will couple to each other and then they become really large fermions. Uh, but uh, all that confusion in your mind, and we'll figure out the answer later tomorrow. Uh, any other questions? Was it a question? Yeah. I wanted to ask that uh, the endpoint uh, my one operators, I can do a linear combination of them and come back to form answer. Okay. And come back what? So uh, the, the endpoints have uh, two leftover time and operators. I can combine them and uh, come back to complex uh, fermion operators, right? Yeah, but that's a very, a very, very messy fermion. That is absolutely correct. But let's think about, that's a very good question. Uh, you can. But let's think about physical processes. In particular, there's a physical process that, uh, you know, my work on this, my around this depends on, which is tunneling electrons to the edge. Right? Uh, because that's how you would see a zero mode, and that's how Leo Kovenhoven first tries to see this. So what you do is you have to couple this edge with this chain, right? And that would be written as a term that's a hopping of whatever is in here. Let's say, let's call it the D state, times something in here. That's my run up. Well, actually, sorry. Let me rephrase. You start off with an electron on the tip. It has to land somewhere here, right? But over here, it lands 
gamma 1 plus plus gamma 1 minus. So that's right. 1 to C, it will be this. Right? That's what it will be. C. D dagger C. So only the Majorana that is localized here in the chain will have an overlap with this last C. Right? Right? So in fact, when you tunnel, you will only tunnel into the first Majorana. In fact, you can show that somehow the tunneling will evolve into this. So it doesn't evolve necessarily into that. There might be a phase between them. But there will be some real combination between D dagger and D times the left Majorana. And then the coupling to the right Majorana will be suppressed by an exponential length of the chain. So in that sense, you can formally write this fermion the way you wanted it. That describes the ground state manifold and the operators that go between the manifold. However, you can go between the two ground states by just applying C here. So it still changes the parity. That's clear? So the size of the chain actually is a, is a fat, big factor here, right? Yeah. Because the overlaps are not small enough, yeah. exponentially small. Exactly. Exactly. So the chain, the chain, uh, the Majorana is exponentially localized. That's actually a, the a question about the translation invariance. It's a consequence of the translational invariance, right? This is a close cousin of the e to the ik. Uh, yeah, so the exponential decay is what guarantees the two Majorana separated. And that's a, another thing about topological protection. Everything has an extent. Every Majorana has an extent. So in topological protection, is there up to an exponentially small factor in the size. Right? So it's the exponential protection that translates to topological protection. Anything else? So if you have make this uh, ring, so there will no, never be a Marana mode or that's right. The the couple from the other side and they'll split. And it will be a gamma left, gamma right, times something before the one, and it's split. That's right. So in the ring, you won't see it, because the ring doesn't have it. That's absolutely right. OK, so let's move on and start talking about realization in solid state. So Kitaya, in his 2001 paper, commented about whether this can be realized. Yeah, he has a statement about this. Uh, either in the abstract or in, or in the conclusion, or in both. But what he says is that realizations in solid state. No. <laughs> he said that. So he says, maybe the spin always is happening. Maybe that will help to get this pure superconductor. And then he says, nah, even that won't help you. <laughs> That's what it says in this paper. I'm not inventing it. Yeah. But it turns out that you can have. It turns out that it was wrong. You could realize it. You could realize it wrong. Uh, so the first realization came, at least theoretically, from coin came. And on the heels of discovering the behavior of 2D topological insulators. If you have a 2D topological insulator, the quantum wall insulator, uh, sorry, a spin wall insulator, it has an edge state, which is a metal, consisting of two spins going up in the directions. I was doing the same direction, I need to. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, there we go. Okay. I almost got it. Uh, must be one of those psychology tests. All right, so you can have a spin up going one way. And the spin down going the other way. The Hamiltonian that you would write for that on the edge would look like this. Sigma z times the velocity of the edge times the momentum. Right? So depending on whether you're up or down, you're going to the right or to the left. If you feel like it, you can even put a magnetic field. In principle, I should write b dot sigma. So let me just write a sigma x. Bx sigma x. Let me just write a minute field in this direction. Time is short. And then it says, take this baby, put a superconductor next to it, 
And automatically you get a phase that will be D wave superconducting. Why? Because you only, you only have one flavor of fermions in here. Right? It's only one flavor. Fermions come in combinations of right movers and left movers. And then on top of that, you can have spin. But here you have only one right mover and only one left mover. And the spin is coming along for the right, literally. So if you manage to proximatize this, you get a new wave superconductor. So I'm going to do another bit of blackboard algebra in the sense that I'm going to upgrade this to a PDG Hamiltonian very quickly. So write, if you're writing notes, write this, and then prepare to write another line, which is this. With proximity, I need to have a boost space, particle and hole, I just multiply this. I think Liang Fu came up with a trick that allows you to not multiply this by tau z. And then you have proximity. What is the trick? The trick is that when you want to write an Hamiltonian in terms of C and C daggers, in this uh, way of writing, the pounding matrices, so particle, particle, hole, hole, for so tau z, and the sigma z is up, down, up, down, right? So Niang Fu was saying, write it in this basis. So this basis represents this creation and annihilation operator, CP up, C, uh, P down, right, so up and down, corresponding to up and down, C minus P down, minus C, P up. OK? So this minus C in inversion in the whole section is what allows you to write this in this nice way. It's a nice trick. Right, and this, it was claimed, has my arms in it. I think I have time to do this. So actually, this model is always topological. Because net states of the topological insulator are topological objects. And <clears throat> so first of all, let's find the phase diagram, right? Starting with the phase diagram, I mean really starting with finding the spectrum. So how do I find the spectrum of that thing? If you have a Hamiltonian that's written in terms of poly matrices, it's just an invitation to do what? Square it. That's the only reason why the poly matrices are there. They square it to one, they anti-commute. Great. Let's start with squaring this component. So let me write H of K for full K. If I square it, look, the VP doesn't, the VP anti-commute with the B, it anti-commutes with the delta, right? So definitely I have VP squared in that text. Now, the B and the delta actually commute with each other, right? But I can also write this as sigma x times sigma x, right? And I pull sigma x out. When I square that, it will be 1. So then I have uh, b plus delta tau x sigma x squared. Oh, actually, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And then you tell me, you should tell me, well, you told us to square this, and you promised us that you get rid of all the poly matrices, but look, you did it. You <laughs> <laughs> <In> a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, you're so disappointed because you know that in 10 minutes I have to shut up anyway. To be quiet, sorry, I have to be quiet anyway. Uh, but this is not so bad. Because the sigma x tau x, try to commute it with the Hamiltonian. It commutes. Right? It commutes with sigma x, commutes with tau x, no surprise, but it also commutes with sigma z and tau z because both of them are anti commuting. So you can just make a decision, make an executive decision whether this object is plus one or minus one. And we'll again choose the minus one. I don't know why I'm so negative today. <laughs> if we choose the minus one, then this would be b minus delta squared. So the dispersion for this, if, uh, 
Okay, so definitely we want parabolas with B, right? But if B and delta are different, and you can see from this plus minus selection that they have to be different in absolute value, right? Then we get a gap phase. If they are the same, we get back the same dispersion that we had before. Without the proximity and without the magnetic field, they cancel each other. So now we can, so this is momentum, this is energy, right? And when you have this degeneracy, that's the phase transition between the topological, sorry, between the superconducting and the paramagnet. So, if I if I'm making another diagram so close you think it's the same diagram, because that's the diagram I want to make. B, delta, I'll make a cross here too. If B is bigger than delta, I have a paramagnet. If delta is bigger than B, I have a superconductor. And this repeats over here in every quadrant. Where do the Majoranas live? It's, it's when this cross happens, right? It's when the degeneracy occurs. The degeneracy leaves behind the Majorana fermion. So it happens when you have a domain wall between these two pieces. Do you see why I got all these things? You following? I didn't understand the argument of the age, uh, when the Majorana modes survives. Ah, so any domain wall will have Majorana modes in this case. Which is to say, you can't actually terminate the topological insulator edge just to kind of connect to itself, right? So every time that you have a domain wall between a magnet and a superconductor, you will have another domain wall between a superconductor and a magnet. There's no other option. But how do we see that it will be a Majorana? We don't, yet. We just think that it's a pure superconductor, and therefore, in analogy to the Kitai model, when we close it, there will be a phase with Majoranas. Right? But, uh, uh, but we haven't seen it yet. Let me show it to you. Let's make a model. So if indeed, uh, if indeed there's supposed to be a Majorana in the domain wall, right? Let's make, let's analyze the case of B, which is just delta plus Bx. Little bx. And let's see if that topologizes in my run. Because what it will give you, here's delta, here is b, according to this. And if you think about the gap, it looks like this. And the gap is really always at momentum zero, right? So it's at momentum zero. It's whatever is in here, square root. But this will be square. So the gap globally looks like this without thinking about the momentum. But now we have space dependence, so that's not exactly right. So I'll put this in quotes. But maybe wherever the gap closes and you're topological, you leave something behind. That's where you expect the Majorana to show up. Now let's see. If I stick this in here, right, then I can try to solve this. But actually, that would be wrong. Because when I square this, I assume something. I assume that everything is constant, right? So let's start from the beginning. Let me lower this for a second. And I'm sorry if it will become really fast for you to have to write this. But let me erase these guys. And now let me substitute this, uh, sorry, this to be delta plus bx minus bx plus bx plus x. Okay? Now, another thing, we decided that this thing is minus 1, right? So we decided that tau x sigma x is minus 1. That means that we decided that tau x is minus sigma x. It's the same thing, right? So for the purpose of this calculation, I can just switch tau x for minus sigma x, right? And then what would happen? This would be tau z sigma z v b plus sigma x times dx. 
because the delta will cancel. That I can square, right? No problem. V squared, P squared, plus V squared, X squared. Is that right? Is that all? Now, So sigma x, sigma z and p commute, but p and x don't commute, right? So because sigma z and sigma x anti-commute, sigma z, sigma x is i, sigma y, right? And then I have to write here p, x, commute here. It's very important, actually. It's extremely important. Because we're looking for a zero state, right? This is a harmonic oscillator over here. No zero states. This is what zero state is going to come from. This, oops, sorry. This thing is 1 over i. Right? That will cancel this i. Now I can go back here and modify the squared equation. d squared x squared plus tells me sigma y, and I get so excited I forgot to write the coefficients over here. Right, so there's a coefficient v, and there's a coefficient d, right? V, v. And again, you're going to complain that I didn't get rid of all my poly matrices. <laughs> and again, I'll tell you, look at this one. I think, Well, I would say look at this one, it commutes with the Hamiltonian, but that's false. <laughs> However, it commutes with tau x sigma x. Right? So you can again decide whether you want this to be plus one or minus one. And we'll have corresponding spectrum for both. Right? So this would be either plus one or minus one. We have a four-dimensional Hilbert space. We already decided that sigma x tau x is minus one. This will define the remaining uh, z to the degree of freedom. Right? So you, you have the spectrum for plus one, you have the spectrum for minus one, we'll see it in a second. This is an harmonic oscillator, right? I know immediately to solve it. It's n plus a half times whatever the angular frequency is. Angular frequency is square root of k over m, right? But I don't see k and m over here. It's a bit of a letdown. It will be the product of whatever sits in front of the x squared over that times whatever sits in front of the p squared, but there's halves that we need to put in by hand, right? So in this case, it would be 2v squared, that's 1 over m. And 2p squared, that's 1 over, sorry, that's k. We need to take the square root of this because of the square root of k over m. Plus minus dp. No problem. 2n plus 1, dd plus minus dd. Uh -huh. Check this out. Oh, I don't have how to erase anymore. Here, I erase this. So it seems like I have for this e squared, and this is e squared, I have one set of solutions. That looks like this, the function of n. And another set of solution, so that was the set of solution of the minus one, and another for the plus one. The plus one will just double up these guys. Why? Because you have to take a square root, right? There will be one solution at zero, but for every positive solution, there should be a particle whole symmetric solution on the other side of the minus. So the two solutions. <coughs> so we did. I wanted to circle this, but then it would look like all others. So we did find a zero mode. What does it look like? A harmonic oscillator solution, right? Exponentially decaying with minus x squared. It's not minus x because this is no longer translation invariant, because I have the magnetic field dependent on x. That's what gives us the minus x squared. So what did I do? I showed you the this uh, Foucault model when you have a barrier between just magnetic field and just superconductor, you get a Majorana, Majorana state. 
And then you can solve it exactly if you assume that, that the interface happens linearly. Namely, the magnetic field changes linearly relative to the gap. Relative to the current. OK. I think my time is up. So before I ask for questions, I'll just say, tomorrow, the first five minutes, I'll show you that while two-dimensional topological insulators are hard to produce outside of Würzburg and Rice, uh, <coughs> can think about doing this. And in fact, I've seen experiments in uh, UCLA by Kang Wang's group are coming very close to realizing this setup with topological insulators. However, an easier solution came up, which is just to use spin-orbit coupled wires. I'll talk about this for the first five minutes tomorrow, and then I'll move on to this non opinion agenda. All right, questions? It works with spin-orbit coupling wires. Does that mean Kitaev was right? He was right that spin-orbit is the good thing. I mean, Kitaev is always right in the end. That's <laughs> 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 it? <laughs> but, it's, but the, in the end, is important. So if you ask him a question and, and he thinks that it won't work, it's not a reason why to stop thinking. But in the end, he will always be right. Uh, yeah, I have the weight of geography given that his door is across from mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, any other questions? OK, thanks. Oh, we have one more question. Ah. Yes. And just kind of on the basics, uh, what you're talking about in the first half. So you use like sometimes you use like language like uh, you know like a, a Meyer on a state or like a fermion state, but they're kind of different things, right? Like you can think of like C and C dagger as like corresponding to a real like Hilbert space, a local Hilbert space, but the Meyer on operators don't correspond to that. So like, how do you think of of these as like modes that are kind of separate from the definition of like a, a full fermion or a yeah. full, full spin half. Yeah. So, so there will be a little bit of that tomorrow. It's confusing as hell. Let me give you the one minute version. So you have a Hilbert space, and there are many ways in which you can write the operators that take you from one state in the Hilbert space to another, right? Ultimately, you also have a Hamiltonian. But then you want to start asking about the ladder operators of the Hamiltonian, right? The operators such that if you commute them with the Hamiltonian, will give you themselves times an energy. Right? So H comma C dagger will give you the energy of that C dagger. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when you solve particle symmetric, you know, superconducting Hamiltonians, it gets a little more complicated because your excitations are a combination of particle and hole, right? And then you, you find operators that are not exactly C and not exactly C dagger, but the superposition, the usual BCS form, right? So then you can ask whether you have, uh, but every Andrea state, every solution that has U, uh, that has the C and C dagger components and they're not equal, has to have a partner in the same way that C and C dagger have partners. It has to have the particle all symmetric. You can excite, you can de excite that Andrea state. But ultimately, you have a BCS ground state. And the solution with the positive energy is the one that excites you. And the one with the negative energy is the one that de-excites you that will also annihilate the BCS state. Right? There's a construction like that. Now, as you go through that construction, you could have solutions that have no partners. But they have to be at zero energy. And those are the, these Majoranas. In the sense that they commute with the Hamiltonian, which means that it's like they create an excitation with energy zero, right? Yeah. And then wherever you have a Majorana, just because of the integrity of the Hilbert space, there has to be another Majorana somewhere. And together, they give rise to the algebra that takes you between the ground state manifold, the ground state degenerate states, right? Yeah. And, and allow you to measure that, at least in terms of operators. Right, so, so once you look at the manifold of states that have no energy, you need to somehow know how to move between them, it's, and it's those Majorana zero modes that move around between them. Um, right, so it's like you have two Majoranas that commute with the Hamiltonian, but they're combinations. Uh, but, um, right, they commute with the Hamiltonians, with the Hamiltonian, but doesn't mean that they don't do anything to the wave function, right? So they take you between degenerate states in the Hamiltonian. And you can think about it as having a zero parity state. 
And then the Majoranas will connect you with the or negative parity states and they'll connect you with the positive parity state. So between the zero particles to the one electron, the one half Cooper pair. So that's how I think about it. Sorry, it was a little longer than two minutes. But it is a very confusing thing, actually. Sure. Well, thanks. Let's thank you one more time.